My name's J.P. Hand, and I've been hunting waterfowl and carving decoys in Cape May County for about 50 years. My family came to Cape May about 325 years ago and has been gunning in the county for about 10 generations. Back in the 1690s, my ancestors and other English whale or yeomen purchased land and settled on the Jersey Cape. They came primarily from East Hampton, Southampton, and other towns on Long Island, New York. These men and their families came to Cape May to hunt whales, raise free-range cattle, and farm land that was less expensive than that they had left behind. As they had back in Long Island, these new arrivals harvested shellfish, hunted waterfowl, and upland game to supplement their diets. I want to tell you a little bit about the history surrounding the waterfowl and traditions of those men, beginning with the early days on up to the present. To do that, I'll focus on the hunting activities of one of those families, the Hildreths, over seven generations. David Hildreth, the patriarch of the family, left Southampton, Long Island, and purchased a plantation about three miles above Cape Island, where he and his descendants would gun the same salt marsh from about 1700 until the 1940s. A century later, and about a decade after the conclusion of the Revolutionary War, his great-grandson, Ephraim Hildreth Sr., wrote in his journal, Went a-gunning on the meadow, shot one duck, but the ice carried it away. Likely not by coincidence, over the next few weeks, he recorded in a journal multiple times the phrase, Working on a skiff for the meadow. Those words may be the earliest reference to waterfowling at Cape May. Now, Ephraim Hildreth was more than a duck hunter. He was a plantation owner, a surveyor, master of his own trading schooner, and a magistrate. As a ship captain, Hildreth began each entry in his journal by recording the wind and weather, followed by notable events in his life, including his business interests, court cases, and family life. His fame as a sea captain was reported by early Cape May County historian Lewis Townsend Stevens, who wrote, In 1802, Ephraim Hildreth, a grandson of Joshua Hildreth, was busily engaged in running a packet from Cape May to Philadelphia, and we find that he made quick trips, leaving here one day and reaching Philadelphia the next, and vice versa. He was connected with many enterprises and recorded his doings faithfully in a diary which he kept. For his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, gunning for ducks and shorebirds in Cape May County was surely a primitive affair using matchlock and early flintlock fowling pieces. In the first 100 years of European settlement, not much changed for the county's gunners, men who harvested ducks, geese, shorebirds, and railbirds on the Cape's vast salt meadows. Their primary motivation was to provide food for their families, though I'm sure they regarded it as pleasant work. Captain E. from Hildreth, on the other hand, as a relatively wealthy sportsman who sailed from Cape May to Philadelphia on a regular basis, was able to purchase the best and latest fouling tackle, including his six-gauge percussion cap market gun that survives to this day. While he did carve his own powder horns, in Philadelphia he could purchase what he couldn't make, including black powder and lead shot graduating in size from the finest bird shot up to swan shot. In the early 1800s, Hildreth and his fellow Cape May County gunners had at their disposal a veritable duck hunter's paradise. Within walking distance of their farms, they had easy access to unlimited salt marshes, pristine wooded barrier islands with freshwater ponds teeming with ducks, and open sounds connected by channels, thoroughfares, and creeks. The county's very small population meant little competition for the vast resources. In addition, the state of New Jersey varies from about 40 to 70 miles wide, with the exception of Cape May County, which funnels down to a peninsula that is roughly 9 to 10 miles wide by 35 miles long. Then as now, that geographical feature created a natural concentration of all types of migratory birds during their migrations. Not long after Ephraim Hildreth penned those words about his duck hunt, a drastic change would overcome the isolated county. The change was in part due to Hildreth himself and other local schooner captains 
as well as a few enterprising local innkeepers who saw the potential of hosting tourists who began to visit Cape Island for the purpose of sea bathing. Within a few decades, Cape May had become one of the most popular destinations on the eastern seaboard. After 1800, the ever-increasing flow of summer visitors led to other opportunities for the residents of the county. Local waterfowlers who were already gunning to feed their families and those market hunters who supplied eastern cities with game found that their skills and services were much in demand among out-of-town sports. These usually wealthy sportsmen would pay good money for the opportunity to kill railbirds, shorebirds, ducks, and geese. Men like Captain Hildreth and Delaware Bay pilot Recompense Han of Cape Island and Thomas Beasley and Captain Uriah Smith from the opposite end of Cape May County were guiding fowlers and anglers by the 1820s. A decade before the Civil War, the 30 from Hildreth began making his mark on the world. He went to sea as a young man, and in 1866 had his own schooner, the Congress, built on the very same meadows that his grandfather and father had gunned. By 1870, he was living the life of a wealthy farmer, running his businesses, killing ducks, and carving decoys. Later in life, he leased out part of his salt meadow to a group of sports known officially as the Snipe Club, the lease included the right to build a clubhouse on high ground adjacent to the marsh. The earliest visitors to Cape May arrived by water on sloops, schooners, and steamboats, or by stage over rough, unpaved roads. By 1863, a rail line was completed between Camden, New Jersey, and Cape May. Instead of a one-day sail each way, the trip to the shore by train could be made in three and a half hours. For the first time, day trippers could experience what Cape May County had to offer. In 1883, Forest and Stream magazine published a list of waterfowl guides along the Jersey coast, including their rates and locations. The article named 31 guides in the county, 14 from Cape May City alone, and covered the entire coast of the Cape, from Beasley's Point south to Cape May and up the Delaware Bay to Dennisville. The going rate was $2.50 per day and board. At the same time, sport hunting among the male residents of the county was evolving into a more elaborate part of their culture. Hunting methods became more sophisticated, including the design and construction of new types of gunning skiffs, such as the Egg Harbor Melon Seed in the northern part of the county and the Cape May Sneak Box on Cape Island. Another innovation developed when the locals began to build gunning shacks on pilings near their favorite hunting spots. These small cabins, built above the tide line, allowed them to get away from it all for days at a time. After a day's gunning, the shacks served as a cookhouse, bunkhouse, and entertainment center all in one, a place where the old timers could play cards, drink, and talk politics. Now mostly gone, they were a common sight along the intracoastal waterway from Beasley's Point to Cape May as late as the 1980s. Many of Cape May County's old-time gunners took part in a related activity, carving decoys or stool ducks. Just when the descendants of the early European settlers on the eastern seaboard started carving wooden decoys is unknown, as late 18th century news accounts mention decoys or stool ducks, but don't differentiate between live decoys or wooden birds. That being said, Two of the earliest known decoy carvers in America were Ephraim Hildreth III and his distant cousin, Amos Wheaton. Both Cape May County natives were likely carving wooden stools before the Civil War. Many other local gunners carved decoys for their own use, using the same wood with which they built their boats, sided their houses, and shingled their roofs. The plentiful Atlantic white cedar also known as Jersey or Swamp Cedar, was found in the freshwater wetlands throughout much of the county. Some carved decoys to sell to other hunters, including Harry Mitchell Shewards of Ocean City, who carved and sold decoys until his death in World War II, and Cleve Dabler of Scotch Bonnet, Middle Township. Later, Harry Shewards III carved and sold decoys for 70 years and in turn passed down 
the skills and tricks of the trade to myself and other younger carvers. That tradition still survives to this day as there is a whole new generation of Cape May County decoy makers, male and female, turning out gun and decoys to use or to sell. Llewellyn Hildreth was the seventh generation of the family in Cape May County to gun the salt marshes of the original plantation. He was the son of Ephraim Hildreth III and was still guiding sports as his father had done up until World War II. He was my dad's stepfather and according to my favorite aunt, Ethel May Hawker, Men would come down on the train, change into their gunning clothes, and store their street clothes in wardrobes in the brick basement of the house. Dad Hildreth would take them gunning out on the meadow, and when they returned, they would change clothes again and return to the city. As for the waterfowler's quarry, over the last three centuries, the numbers and types of waterfowl at Cape May have fluctuated considerably. It is believed that the Jersey Cape never had a large Native American population, so we can assume that their impact on the bird populations was minimal. We can imagine that those early European hunters that roamed Cape May's vast salt marshes were amazed at the bounty before them. Or as the famed ornithologist Alexander Wilson wrote in 1813, if birds are good judges of excellence in climate, Cape May has the finest climate in the United States for it has the greatest variety of birds. The small population and relatively primitive firearms during the first century of European settlement likely had little effect on the waterfowl numbers in Cape May County, though the numbers of ducks, geese, and shorebirds would drop significantly in the second 100 years. Coincidentally, the development of the percussion cap, which replaced flintlocks on firearms and made muzzle-loading shotguns dependable in damp or wet weather, occurred at the same time that the tourist industry in Cape May County really took off. By the time of the Civil War, the populations of all types of waterfowl on the Cape were in decline. The introduction of more efficient shotguns was only one of the causes of the drop in numbers of species. Overhunting, night hunting, a lack of limits and set seasons, and a general lack of any conservation measures all contributed to the decline. Market hunters were likely the greatest cause in the drop in waterfowl populations at Cape May. These men were hunting for a living, though I'm sure they enjoyed the work. They knew what they were doing and would let ducks, geese, or shorebirds light into their decoys and then shoot into the flocks with the purpose of getting as much game with the least amount of shot and powder expended. The fact that most early decoys from Cape May County and elsewhere or peppered with shot holes is evidence of the manner of hunting. The market gunners used large gauge shotguns and took a heavy toll on the flights of shorebirds and ducks on their seasonal migrations. The birds were shipped in barrels to Philadelphia, Trenton, and other large cities. There, the local papers would publish the market price when birds were available. Ducks, geese, and some upland birds were sold by the pair or singularly while rail birds and reed birds were sold by the dozen. The great flocks of curlews, plovers, yellow legs, and other snipe were so decimated that by the early 1900s, the hunting of shorebird species was banned entirely. Most gunners of the World War II generation, especially those who gunned the ocean side of the county, never shot a wood duck or a teal. Many of the men of that era shot black ducks almost exclusively or at best the three B's, Blackies, Bluebills, and Brant. Occasionally they would get some Golden Eyes, Widgeon, and if the winds were blowing hard from the west, they might get a crack at migrating Canada geese pushed east from the Delaware River. Years ago, the late Tom Benner told me how he and his father gunned the meadows between Stone Harbor and Cape May Courthouse, where they shot mostly Blackies, Shelleys, and Old Mammies. The last two mentioned were red breasts and mergansers and old squalls. I've been gunning ducks and railbirds in Cape May County for 50 years. For the past 35 years, I've guided part-time as well. When I started duck hunting in 1967 at the age of 14, I believe the limit was seven black ducks a day. In 1982, when the limit was dropped to one per day, Many of the old-timers gave up gunning waterfowl because mostly all they shot were black ducks. 
they felt that going out for one duck wasn't worth their while. In fact, at about that time, a new generation of waterfowlers was finding that the gunning was getting better, especially on the Delaware Bay side of the county. In the last quarter of the 20th century, many species began making a comeback, including green wing and blue wing teal, gadwalls, and wood ducks. While the reduction in the limit of the black duck, that staple of the salt marsh, was unpopular, the effects are indisputable. When scouting the meadows by boat in recent years, I've often put up flocks of 40 to 50 black ducks at a time, where in the past I might put up a handful. Other species that have become more common here include hoodemergansers, gadwalls, and ruddy ducks. So much of the history of this special place and the gunners who loved it is mostly forgotten. Little details, like how decoy maker and hunter Charlie Han could call black ducks by mouth, he didn't need a call, or how though they weren't the prettiest ones out there, local hunters liked Cleve Davlin's decoys because the bodies were oversized and the heads were small, which made for a content-looking duck when on the water. How teachers throughout the county knew not to expect many boys to show up during the first week of September, as it was the beginning of mud hen season. Or the poignant tale of the local gunner and prominent judge, Henry Hand Eldridge, who, while bedridden and slowly dying, craved roasted black ducks like he had eaten throughout his long life, and the New Jersey State Troopers, who were fellow waterfowlers and knew him from court, who brought ducks for his wife to cook for him. Over 200 years have passed since Ephraim Hildreth recorded how he went a-gunning on the meadow, shot one duck, but the ice carried it away. His grandson, the decoy maker, has been gone for a century, but the traditions associated with waterfowling are very much alive in Cape May County today. No matter whether some of our seasoned gunners who know the salt marsh like the back of their hand, or a couple of local teenagers out with plastic decoys and lots of new camo, the feelings are the same. The preparation, the excitement, and the satisfaction that is hard to explain to a non-hunter, but no explanation is needed to a fellow duck hunter. Despite early season mosquitoes or frozen fingers and toes in late winter, there's something about the salt meadow that draws you back to it. You could say that the waterfowling tradition at Cape May is like the salt marsh itself, always changing, but changing ever so slowly. <laughs>